Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds, and today we're covering topic 5.5, which is irrigation. Irrigation is a super important topic for agriculture because it kind of has the unique ability to make land that's previously too dry for agriculture suitable for growing food. So if we take a look at this picture to the right here, these are irrigation circles, which you can see from an aerial view here. So the surrounding land, although it's very dry and arid, it maybe doesn't get enough rainfall to support agriculture with irrigation is capable of growing food. And so this is just a really important topic to understand as it relates to food production. Today we'll be focusing on the environmental impacts of overusing water, but also the different methods of irrigating so that water use can be conserved. So we have a million objectives here with irrigation as a topic, but it's not quite as extensive as it looks. Our basic overall goal today is to describe different irrigation methods and to describe the benefits and drawbacks of each of those methods. So we'll be focusing on four methods of irrigation, but then we also need to look at the environmental effects of overwatering so we can understand how that can be avoided. Our suggested science skill for today is describing disadvantages, advantages, or unintended consequences of potential solutions. So here we'll talk about the four main methods of irrigation and their different advantages and disadvantages. So we'll start out with furrow irrigation, which is just digging a trench along your crop rows and filling it with water. This is cheap and easy, uh, but it's the least efficient method. So you lose about 33% of your water as runoff. And that's a problem if your water is expensive and it's a problem because that's 33% not getting into your crops. Flood irrigation is also very cheap and easy. It's just like what it sounds like, flooding your field with water. The problem though is this can cause water logging in your soil We'll talk about the consequences of that shortly. And this is really only suitable for certain crops like cranberries or rice that can tolerate totally waterlogged soil. The next type of irrigation is spray irrigation. This is far more efficient. So you're gonna lose a lot less water to evaporation or to runoff, but it's a lot more expensive because you need to purchase the equipment, this large uh, spraying device. And then you also need to spend money on energy to pump water usually from the ground up into the sprinkler or from nearby surface water. So it's quite, quite a bit more expensive. And then finally, we have drip irrigation. Drip irrigation is the most efficient by far. Uh, it's gonna be over 95% efficient, so it's gonna conserve water. It's going to prevent water logging. It's gonna prevent soil salinization, which we'll talk about shortly. But the problem is that it's very expensive and it's just not practical for some crops. You're not gonna run miles and miles of hose material out over you know, cornfields or wheat fields usually. So drip irrigation is more limited to vegetables generally or crops that are grown in smaller amounts of land. Now we'll talk about water logging, which is something that can happen with excessive water use. So when you water your crops more than the soil can hold, the water fills up all of the pore space in your soil. We can see that in the diagram here to the right. All of those pore spaces, some of which used to be filled with air, are all now filled with water. The problem is this doesn't allow air into these pores, and so the roots can't take in the oxygen in the air that they need in order to grow. This can stunt plant growth, so it can slow plant growth down, but it can also kill your plants altogether if they're not tolerant to waterlogged soils. So I mentioned uh, earlier in the video, there's only certain crops that can really tolerate fully waterlogged soils, and so this is something that's gonna kill a lot of different crops. Solutions could be using drip irrigation, so you're not adding as much water in the first place. And then there's another solution called soil aeration. So you can do this by stabbing a pitchfork into your soil or by using a machine that will take little cores or take little chunks out of your soil. And that allows your soil to drain. So you can see here in the middle diagram with those cores or those holes drilled into the soil, water can soak down into the soil. So there's more pore space. Air can also reach the roots. And so over time, after you've aerated your soil, this can actually lead to deeper root growth. It can lead to uh, water penetrating your soil deeper. And so aeration can not only solve water logging, but it can also be beneficial to crop growth over time. Next, we'll talk about soil salinization. So salinization is the process of salt building up in soil over time. One of the main ways that it happens is when farmers irrigate their crops with groundwater. So groundwater naturally contains small amounts of salt. So when that groundwater is pumped up and put onto crops, over time, the water will evaporate and that will leave salt behind. As this happens over years and years, that salt will eventually build up to a concentration that's so high 
that it may dehydrate the roots of the plants. It may not allow them to get the water they need. And so this can stunt plant growth and it can even kill plants if they're not tolerant to high levels of salt. So solutions here, drip irrigation is a great solution because you minimize your water input. Um, a really great solution though is switching to a fresh water source of water. So instead of using groundwater, potentially using lake or streams that are fresh water, you could aerate your soil here as well. That would allow water to drain through and carry the salt and wash it down deeper in the soil where it won't be harming the roots. And you can even sort of flood or rinse out your soil by adding a bunch of fresh water to it, allowing it to run off and carry a lot of the salt all out of the soil and then start over again with fresh water. So now we'll talk about how water is used globally. And because we're in the impacts of agriculture video for the day, you may have guessed that agriculture is the number one use of water globally. It's about 70% of all water use. So that's really important we understand that. Um, second, we have industrial use. So this is things like manufacturing or power plants that generate electricity. Those use a lot of water. Then we have uh, municipal settings, which are people's homes, things like their showers and their baths. And then finally, agriculture, which is the number one use of water globally. And this is primarily giving water to livestock that people will eat eventually or irrigation of crops that people will eat as well. Now we'll talk about aquifers and groundwater. So groundwater is just water that's stored in the pore space of sediments or rock layers. So we can see in this diagram here that above the water table, we have pores that are filled with both air and water. So there's some water in the soil there, but it's not totally saturated. And then below the water table, we get to an area where pores are completely filled with water. So this is what we would refer to as groundwater. And then aquifers are just groundwater deposits that are usable by humans. So aquifers are replenished by something called groundwater recharge. This is water that rains and then trickles down through the soil to be stored in these underwater deposits. Now we have different types of aquifers. We have unconfined aquifers, which if you look at the diagram, you'll see are aquifers that just exist below the surface of the ground and they don't have any confining rock layer above them. So those are recharged really quickly. Confined aquifers though, are aquifers that have a layer of impermeable rock both above and below. And so they can only be recharged at really small recharge areas, which you can see in the diagram. And so these are longer term storages of water. They're deeper in the ground, they're generally safer, they're generally less contaminated, but they recharge very slowly. So they're far more prone to depletion or overuse. People can draw water out of confined aquifers far faster than they can be recharged by groundwater recharge. So our suggested science skill for practice of our Q5.5 today is to describe disadvantages, advantages, or unintended consequences with potential solutions. So I want you to describe how soil salinization occurs, then propose a solution to prevent it, and finally identify one disadvantage of the solution that you proposed. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in today. Don't forget to like this video if it was helpful. Subscribe for future APES video updates and check out other notes over here to the side. And as always, think like a mountain, write like a scholar.